Hey, right, full screen. All right, thanks for coming out. And you know, it's actually a little bit, you know, a little more than half, which is nice. I think. Actually, no, it's less than half. Whatever. Anyway, so um, uh, we're going to go on to the next topic today. Actually, I'm ahead of schedule, which is nice. Hopefully, uh, I should be able to finish the course relatively early so we can concentrate on the review. But anyway, so we're going to concentrate on the first method of uh, transmitting signals over channels, which is the method of amplitude modulation. So uh, it's one of the more, uh, well, it was the de facto standard for transmitting signals back in about the early uh, 50s or 60s or so. And then obviously FM took over, which is the predominant standard. But still, AM channels are still being used. Uh, and because they're, you know, the, uh, the circuitry to design the demodulation is actually quite simple. And, but anyway, there's more, advantages, uh, there's more advantages that we'll cover uh, as we go on through the course. So amplitude modulation, what exactly is it? Well, uh, first, let's, let's overview, uh, let's give a quick overview of how exactly you would modulate a signal. All right, so um, first off, you have your message signal. So as I talked about, the mes message signal is the raw signal that is converted into its electrical equivalent. So you use a transducer to you know, to um, convert your raw message signal into its equivalent electrical component, you know, electrical equivalent. All right, so that's a baseband signal. So that means that, uh, you know, the, uh, the spectrum components are centered at the zero hertz and they vary from zero up to some, you know, up to some maximum, so it's baseband, right? And then you have a carrier signal. So that carrier signal, the, responsi the responsibilities of the carrier signal is to uh, transform your baseband signal in such a way which would be suitable for the channel to accept. So you can actually transmit the signal over the actual channel. All right. So this the carrier signal is responsible for uh, transforming the uh, message into a format for the channel to accept, I guess. Format uh, for the channel to accept. Sorry. Channel. Okay, so that's the, that's the goal of the carrier. All right? And then the output is what's known as a modulated signal. So what the purpose of the carrier signal is that it takes the frequency components and it shifts them over by some amount. So you're actually moving all the frequency components over by a certain amount. So now it's become a bandpass signal. So what a bandpass signal is, is that you're just taking all your frequency components, moving them over to some center, and then uh, it's no longer centered at zero, it's centered at some known frequency, which we'll call the carrier frequency. All right? All right, so that's the purpose. So there's different ways to modulate a signal, but the purpose is to transform it into a bandpass signal. So in general, uh, we have the following signal that you would, this is what's happening when you put it through the channel. So this is what happens when you're transmitting. So this is the transmitted signal. All right, so there are two ways that you can produce a, you know, a modulated signal, right? So the cosine is obviously uh, common between them all. So what you're transmitting is some sort of cosine wave, but then how exactly that cosine wave appears depends on what kind of modulation you're doing, whether it's AM or FM, all right? So there are two ways you can actually create a modulated signal. The first way is to vary the amplitude, all right? So what this means is that you'll take your message signal and you'll actually vary the height of the cosine wave depending on you know, the contents of the message signal. And that's what's known as amplitude modulation, which we'll talk about later. You can also vary the phase. And then this is the next form of uh, modulation, which we'll cover much later, probably a couple weeks down the road, or maybe three weeks, which is called frequency modulation. So you're actually varying the actual frequency, you know, depending on the contents of your message. So you have a time varying amplitude, so you know you can call this AM, I guess, or amplitude modulation. And this will be FM, which we'll talk about much later. Okay, so this signal here, so this is what your transmitting signal is. It's what's called a rotating phaser. So what that means is that you know the phase can vary over time and also the amplitude can vary over time. So you have some signal that's varying the amplitude, right? So this could be the message. You also have a phase component that, you know, that also varies the actual phase of the signal. And then we have what's known as the instantaneous frequency. So this is a definition that we'll touch on much later when we cover FM, but I just want to cover it now. The instantaneous frequency, what that means is that at any point in time, what is the actual frequency that is examined at that particular point in time? All right. So what this means is that the frequency seen at a particular, okay, at a given time, t. All right. So it's defined as the following. So if you were to, for example, 
let's see here, what, what's going on here? Yes, so it's defined as basically the derivative of the phase. So that's what's defined as the instantaneous frequency. Okay, so that's just the definition, just take it by faith. We'll learn about this much later. But the definition of instantaneous frequency is just basically finding the derivative of the phase. So it's the derivative of the phase. This may not make much sense now, but we'll touch base on it much later when we do FM. It's just I wanted to introduce this now to, to kind of whet your appetite a little bit. Okay, so it's the derivative of the phase, and you also have a scale of one over two pi, and that's important because of you want to respect the radians. Okay, all right. So this is what hap this is what happens when you have what's known as an unmodulated character. So what this means is that you just simply have no message. It's just a cosine by itself. You're not sending any information. It's just a cosine, just a straight off cosine. There's no message associated with the actual carrier. Okay, so this means that there's no message. <coughs> okay, so what I mean by no message is that the uh, cosine height is constant. So, you know, you have a cosine wave like this, right? It's just varying, there's no, it stays the same. So this is AC and then this is minus AC, right? It just stays the same over, a point, you know, at a given point in time. Okay, and there might be a possible, you know, phase shift as well. Okay, so this here is what's known as your, I guess, what, what, what did we call this before? It's what's known as your generalized phase, I suppose, right? So this is your generalized phase. And then you just substitute it into your cosine wave, and that's pretty much what you get. So what it means by an unmodulated carrier is that it's just a cosine straight up. So there's no information you're trying to transmit, or there's nothing you're trying to transmit over the channel. Okay, so that's what a non-modulated carrier means. Okay, so it means that uh, no information, yeah, no, no message, so no information is transmitted. It's the simplest case, and that's not really useful. We want to be able to transmit stuff, right? So that's probably the more useful case. Okay, so the unmodulated carrier has a constant amplitude. I talked about this before. Also, it has what's known as a constant or instantaneous frequency. Okay, so if you, if you remember what the definition of the instantaneous frequency was, all you're doing is finding the derivative of what's inside the cosine, okay? And then you're scaling by one over two pi. Okay, so if I took the derivative of this guy, what's gonna happen is that this goes away, this, this is constant, and then uh, when you take the derivative with respect to time, the t, t goes away, so you're left with two pi fc, and then the two pi's cancel, and then you're left with fc. So that kind of makes sense, right? If you have a cosine wave where the frequency is constant at any point in time when you look at that particular wave, you should expect that the frequency is the same at every single point in time, which makes sense, all right? So frequency is the same at any point in time. Okay, that totally makes sense, which, which is what we expect. It's just the cosine wave and there's nothing, no information, it's just same frequency at every point in time. Okay, that's cool. Okay, so this is what I want to touch base on. So it carries no information. So this is the transmitted signal. It, there's n absolutely no information you're transmitting. It's just uh, just a, you know just a cosine with a with a standard height, and that's it. Okay. So what this is saying here is that every single component, so your your amplitude, your frequency, and your phase, they're all independent of your message. So no matter how you vary these particular values. There's no message being transmitted, okay? So no message being transmitted. Just wanted to start off with a simple case. Okay, fine, that's cool. Okay, so then here's where we're gonna start off. This is amplitude modulation. So what amplitude modulation is, is that you're taking your carrier, so the carrier, the purpose of the carrier is to transmit your message and put it into another side of the spectrum. You're pushing all the frequency components over by a certain amount, okay? So how you do that is you take your carrier, which is initially constant in amplitude, but then you're gonna vary the height of the carrier based on the, mes you know, the message contents. And how you do that is you basically just multiply your message by the carrier. So what G of M of T means is that it is some function that is dependent on M of T. Okay, so that's what this is. It may be just the message itself. It may be something that is dependent on the message. We'll talk about that later. But what this is saying here is that this is a function that is dependent on the message. Okay? Also note that the actual frequency of the wave itself, the frequency stays constant. So the frequency 
is constant at any point in time, at any time t. Okay, so the frequency is going to be constant, but the height of the actual wave will not, and it depends on the message signal that you're trying to transmit. Okay, so the frequency and then the instantaneous frequency, we, ex we expect that, that's totally fine. Right, so this and this actually match up. Okay, so this is what's happening. So phi of AMT, this is what it means when you're transmitting by amplitude modulation. So I'm going to call amplitude modulation AM for short because I don't want to keep writing amplitude modulation. It's just a lot. It takes a lot of time. So AM, right? So when you actually tune into your radial, you'll see that there are two sides. There's AM and there's FM. So AM means amplitude modulation and FM means frequency modulation, which we'll talk about much later. Okay? So what you are transmitting is a carrier or a cosine wave where the height of the carrier will change depending on what the message signal is contained. So that's what this that's what this fact means. So m of t is embedded in a time varying amplitude. All right. So what you're doing is you're varying the height of the carrier using the message. Okay. So what is that? What what exactly does this look like? So let's actually. Well, I'll show that in a bit. But let me just cover the other side, which is FM. Okay. So. We'll cover this much later, just want to touch base on this free briefly. So frequency modulation, what frequency modulation does is that you're not varying the amplitude anymore, you're varying the actual frequency. So at any point in time, the frequency is going to change depending on what the actual message, the message signal contains. All right. So what's happening here is that the frequency at any time changes. Okay. So we also know for a fact that when you take the, you know, what the instantaneous frequency is defined as one over two pi, and then the derivative with respect to the phase, right? Okay. So I know this is my instantaneous frequency. So how do I go back and figure out what the actual phase is? So if you want to figure out what the actual phase is, what you can do is you can integrate both sides, right? So you can integrate here with respect to dt, right? integrate with respect to dt. And then when you integrate the derivative, it's just equal to the function itself, right? So in this case, you'll have 1 over 2 pi, and then phi of t, and then it's equal to the integral of whatever this guy is, all right? So in this case, what I need to do is, I want, if I want to figure out what the phasor is, I have to integrate this guy with respect to t. So if I want to do that, it's actually quite simple, right? So if I want to integrate this guy, Okay, so it's the integral of f of c and then plus kf. kf is a constant which we'll talk about much later. m of, let's see here, alpha d alpha. The reason why I'm changing variables here is because I don't want to confuse the, um, I don't want to confuse the actual integration bounds, all right? So let's see here. Let me introduce another page. Yeah, I'll, I'll upload these, of course, as uh, you know, as we, as uh, as when I'm done here. So once you have this, let's see here. So you go from zero to t. Also, the integration is important because uh, you're you're taking a look at it in terms of t, right? So zero is important because you're assuming no initial conditions. Okay. So once you have this, and then when you integrate, all right. Let's see here. Oopsie. Uh, yes. Let me just go here. Okay, so I'm gonna do this as before. There's also a uh, one over two pi phi of t, okay, or theta of t. So you have this guy. We can split it up. Uh, integral, and then we have uh, kf m of t. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the variable so you don't confuse it with because it doesn't make sense to have a variable t here and a variable t there. It doesn't really make much sense. So when I integrate this, okay, what's going to happen is that I'm going to have fc of t and then plus kf m of t. All right. And then there's usually some constant uh, associated with this when you do the integration. There's usually some leftover constant. So that's equal basically to the phase. And then I have one over two pi. Okay, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this guy, bring it over on this side here, and then you finally get this. So you have 2 pi FCT. Oops, and then I have a, uh, yeah, that's fine. Ah, well, we can leave it like that, that's fine. We'll just leave it like that. 
We actually don't know what the actual integration is, so we're just going to leave it like that. Sorry. Let's just do alpha. I'll leave it in uh, I'll leave it in factored form or the function form because we actually don't know what the actual function is. So by convention we just do it like that. And then plus. Okay. But anyway, just let's just, you know, let's just extra for you. But that's how it's derived. Okay. So you have this as an instantaneous frequency. When you integrate, that's what you get. And KF is some factor that controls the, uh, you know, how much it's modulating. So the higher it is, the more modulation you want, the more the frequency, you know, the more frequency varying you get. And the smaller the constant is, the less frequency varying you get. But anyway, so but the important messages, which I'll talk about much later, is that you are taking your message and you're changing the frequency at each point in time. And that's actually a more efficient, mainly because the amplitude stays constant, but the frequency is changing. And we'll talk about efficiency of FM much later, but I just want to touch on this very quickly. Okay, so then finally, so we had amplitude modulation, frequency modulation, and there's also the more uncommon approach, which is phase modulation. So what you're doing is that you're not changing the frequency over time. What you're doing is you're actually changing the phase. So you actually, there's actually a phase shift at each point in time, which is a little unorthodox, but it's okay. All right. So what's happening here is that instead of modifying the frequency, you're modifying the phase. So that's what's happening right here. So you're taking your message signal and you are varying the phase. So this is, remember, this is the phase of the signal. Or phase of carrier, not car signal. Carrier. Oopsie. Carrier. Okay, so that's what you're doing. And then if you want to find the instantaneous frequency, you just, you know, um, you do 1 over 2 pi, the derivative of this. So you 1 over 2 pi, and then d over dt. Okay, and when you do this, you'll get that. The 2 pi's cancel. Also, this will go away because it's constant, and that's what you get. All right, so this is what a phase modulated signal would be. So what you're doing is you're varying the actual phase over time instead of the frequency. So the information is embedded in the phase. And what this means is that the phase is proportional to your message. So the larger the message or the larger the amplitude of your message, the more phase shift you're introducing into your signal. So it's, it's obviously a, you know, it's a, it's a result that you can infer from this. Okay. All right. So enough of that stuff. So let's get on to actually amplitude modulation. So when you actually do amplitude modulation, what's going to happen is you're going to take your frequency components and you're going to shift them plus minus some frequency which is called which is called the carrier so this is what's known as the carrier frequency okay and you want to make sure that this frequency is much larger than the bandwidth of the signal okay so that's usually what is done so frequency okay so that's the carrier frequency so it has components of plus minus f of c and this is the you know this is in terms of f or hertz all right and then you may or may not have a carrier and i'll talk about i'll talk about what this is in a, in a minute there are methods in amplitude modulation where even though you use a carrier to transmit your message, the frequency spectrum, you actually don't see the carrier at the end, which is called a suppressed carrier, but we'll talk about that later. But in general, usually, you know, if your message signal was concentrated in some, you know, uh, if, if, if it was a baseband signal concentrated in some, you know, uh, you know, some range between zero and we'll call this, I guess, B of X, all right? If you do modulation, this is what happens when you modulate, so modulation, or, yeah, this is the, what's the term as modulation, so you are um, multiplying by carrier. What's going to happen is that you'll have um, the actual signal concentrated on F of C. So this would be BX plus F of C. This is BX minus, okay? And this is F of C minus BX and uh, F of C. So plus, no, plus minus. Okay. So when you transmit doing amplitude modulation, you see that you can actually, assuming that your signal is real, that means it's symmetric, you can actually split up your signal into two different portions, okay? There's the upper sideband and the lower sideband. So what the upper sideband is, is that it's basically the region of your spectrum which goes from your center frequency and is increasing up to the last non-zero frequency. So the upper sideband is basically looking at it from, uh, you know, the components that are greater than the actual carrier frequency. So the upper sideband is components uh, greater, you know, components uh, greater than C, okay? So this is the carrier frequency. 
All right, and then you can do the same thing on the negative side. That is the symmetric version. So you're taking a look at it in terms of the negative, if you wish. The lower side band, you're looking at any values that are lower than the actual carrier frequency. Okay, so these are components that are lower than the, you know, than the carrier frequency. So you can split up the upper side band and lower side band. All right. Actually, if your signal is real, you can see that it's both symmetric. You can actually save uh, money and cost if you actually just transmit one of the actual sidebands. So you can actually just transmit the upper sideband or the lower sideband by itself, and then you can reconstruct it on the receiver side. You can piece these two together, and perhaps you can reconstruct your signal. But we'll talk about that uh, in the next class, or two classes from now, where we talk about single sideband. But we're going to take a look at just this general case for now, when you have an upper and a lower sideband, and you may have a carrier or not, and we'll talk about that later. Okay, so the first type of modulation, amplitude modulation, which we'll talk about, is what's known as double sideband suppressed carrier. So what that simply means is that you're going to take your carrier and just blindly multiply it by your message. Simply. It's very simple. Sorry. Okay, sorry, yes? Um, for the last, for the last slide. Yes? So lower sideband um, for the image on the right. Yeah. Um, should it be FC minus? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm just making sure you're paying attention. Yes, thank you. And that should be FC plus, yeah. Getting my notation confused. Okay, but the other the other side I'm pretty sure is correct. All right, okay, is that, we good? Any other questions here? Are we good to go? All right. Okay, so uh, the next, the first method of modulation or where you want to transmit it over the channel is what's known as double sideband suppressed carrier, which is known as DSBSC. So what you're doing here is you're just simply taking your carrier and just multiplying it by your message just blindly without any consideration. So all you're doing is multiplying the carrier by the message by itself. That's it. Okay? That's simply what you're doing here. So C of T is what is known as your carrier. So it's just simply cos of 2 pi, you know, it's just it's just the cosine wave with a frequency of FC. Okay? Just want to write that out. Okay. All right. So this is your message signal, and then what you want to do is take your message signal, and then you want to multiply it by this carrier frequency with a constant amplitude of A of C. Okay. Actually, let me just put A of C here, just to be sure that we know what we're talking about. So C of T is, and then there's a amp, there's an amplitude associated with that actual carrier. Okay. So when you, this is a result of taking one and two and multiplying them together. Okay, so when you do that, rem what's happening here is that you are varying the height of the carrier based on the height of the message. Okay, so as this is decreasing, you'll notice that you know this carrier it it maintains the same frequency, but you'll notice that the actual height of the carrier is decreasing with respect to the height of the message. And then you get to a point right here when you hit the zero, and then as soon as you cross the zero and you go below, what's going to happen is that the sign of the carrier changes. So what will happen is that because the sign of the carrier changes, what's, what's happening is that because you have a negative in terms of the carrier, that's interpreted as a 180 degree phase shift. So that's what's happening here. So as soon as your carrier dips, or not carrier, but as soon as your message dips below the uh, horizontal axis, what's happening is that your carrier has a 180 degree, f uh, degree phase shift, which is what's known as a phase reversal. Okay. So this is what happens when the uh, message goes below zero in amplitude, all right? That happens because as soon as your message goes below zero, you're going to have a negative value for your message, and your negative times your cosine would visualize that as a 180 degree phase shift because you have a negative cos now instead of a positive cos, all right? So that's what's known as phase reversals. Okay, so what does this look like in terms of frequency? Okay, so um, this is what happens when you, so this is the time domain, okay, and this is the frequency domain. And I also like to point out, it's very, very important that the carrier frequency is much, much larger than the bandwidth of the signal, okay? So this is, so this is saying that the carrier frequency is much larger than the uh, signal bandwidth or the message signal bandwidth. Okay, that's that's a uh, that is a restriction. Sir, yes. Sir, um, a, a multiple you have to go like ten times larger or something. 
Uh, the larger the frequency, the more power your carrier transmits, the more expensive your receiver will be. So you have, there's a compromise. But the thing is though, the higher the power, the more robust it is against noise. So it's actually, it's a little push and pull. So you usually want to make the carrier frequency as high as possible, but then at the same time, the receiver electronics could be more expensive because they're transmitting more power. But at the same time, it'll be robust against noise. But if you make the carrier frequency smaller, it'll cost less, but it'll be more susceptible to noise. So it's a little bit of push and pull. The, the uh, Canadian radio and television uh, communication standards of Canada, they actually dictate what the acceptable carrier frequency should be if you want to transmit. So they actually have standards for you to follow to make sure that you, uh, you follow regulations and you are, you're transmitting properly. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, but yes, yeah, so, there's, so it's, it's, it's a little push and pull, but there are standards that you follow to make sure that you choose the right carrier frequency if you want to be able to uh, properly transmit and receive. Okay, <clears throat> so this is what happens in the frequency domain. And then when you take the Fourier transform of a cosine wave, remember there are two impulses that are centered at the frequency that's concentrating on the actual carrier itself. All right, so this is what happens. Remember, we talked about this uh, a couple of classes ago. If you take your uh, message signal and you multiply by cosine in the frequency domain you're going to take your spectrum and you're going to move it to the left and to the right and then it's centered at the carrier frequency so that's what's happening here okay so if your frequency domain in the frequency domain if your message signal has some height k right you know that has some maximum height and then if your carrier frequency if you are, if you want to figure out what the Fourier transform is there are two impulses remember when you multiply in time you do convolution in the frequency domain so you're moving left and right by f of c and then you have k times ac over 2 right because you have this factor of ac over 2 or the 1 over half comes from the property when you're um when you're actually doing the modulation and then the ac comes from the actual height of the carrier itself and then the k comes from the baseband so you actually get a total height of k ac over 2 okay so if this is your you know your axis here or with zero hertz and then this is what happens for when you actually perform modulation just with multiplication of the carrier. So as you see here, the reason why it's called suppressed carrier is because you actually don't see the actual um, Fourier transform of the carrier itself. All you do is you're just seeing the actual shifted spectrum of the actual message. You don't see the actual carrier, the impulse carriers themselves. That's why you call it suppressed because you actually don't see the carrier at the output. You only see the actual message spectrum instead. Okay, so it's called suppressed carrier. because you don't see the spectrum of the carrier at the output. Whoopsie. The output. Okay, that's why it's called suppressed carrier. Okay, so a little, sorry, it's a little messy here. Okay. So what happens to the actual bandwidth? Remember, when you measure bandwidth with respect to the baseband signals, you're only measuring between zero and the, whatever the, you know, the, the largest non-zero frequency would be. As soon as you modulate, remember, what you're doing is you're taking your baseband message and you're transmitting it and you're shifting it over by plus minus f of c. So what will happen is because you're doing that shifting, because the zero axis is here now, you consider the bandwidth to be the distance between the largest and smallest because you're looking at all of the frequency components that are positive. Because the negative lobes are now shifted over to the positive side, you actually consider the total bandwidth to be the width of the actual spectrum itself. All right? So if the baseband message signal has a bandwidth of B, then the double sideband suppressed ca uh, carrier signal has a bandwidth of 2B, and you require twice the bandwidth if you want to transmit this actual signal over your channel. OK? OK. So if you wanted to generate a double sideband suppressed carrier signal, uh, you, can, you can use a cosine wave if you want, but you can also use a variety of different technologies. You can use a product modulator, a nonlinear or switching modulator. We'll talk about that much later. But you can actually, talk, you can actually generate double sideband suppressed carrier signals in a multiple, uh, multiple variety of ways, not just multiplying by cosine, but you can actually have other electronics that will actually help you do this for you. Okay, so what we're going to talk about first is how you generate a, a double sideband suppressed carrier um, signal is through the use of what's called a nonlinear modulator. Okay, so there are actually electronics in practice. Uh, there's actually what's it's what's known as a nonlinear device, and what that does is that it will take your input and then it produces an output such that you have your original input that's scaled by some factor a, and then the actual input squared 
you know, fact, by some factor B as well. So there's an actual, there are actual electronics that exist that actually do this for you, okay? So if you remember from last class, if we had, uh, you know, we had what's known as nonlinear distortion, where if you take your signal and if you square it or if you take it to the third power, you're actually taking the actual spectrum of your signal and you're spreading it around uh, by different, you know, you're spreading it around or you're moving it around by different offsets. Okay, so the so th what I talked about last class, the reason why you want to take a look at nonlinear spreading is exactly because you want to generate a uh, modulated signal to translate over the channel. Okay, so I talked about last uh, last class, a nonlinear device spreads the spectrum of its input. Okay, and then what you can do is if you control if you have a combination of nonlinear devices and if you control what goes in. You can actually take a look at what's going out and you can actually filter out what you don't need and what's resulting is your actual DSPSC signal, all right? Okay, so here is one example if you wanted to generate a uh, double sideband suppressed carrier signal, all right? So we have this nonlinear device and this is a block diagram of how exactly you'd go ahead and generate that. So we have two branches here. The first branch here is simply taking your message and adding a cosine to it. So this branch would be M of T plus cos omega ct, or 2 pi fct, it doesn't matter what notation you use, okay? And on this side, we have, you're taking your message and subtracting it with the actual carrier. So this is minus m of t plus cos omega ct. Okay, so then each of these inputs go into a nonlinear device, and then we add them up, actually we subtract them, and you get the um, final output here, and we're gonna do something more later. So this output is equal to this guy once you submit it to a nonlinear device. So this message here gets put into a nonlinear device. So that's what happens here. So you're taking M of T plus cos of omega CT. You're putting that into your nonlinear device, and this is what you get. So this is actually the first half, right? So this is the first half here, okay? And the second half here, what you're doing is you're taking your message, subtracting with the cosine, and putting it through a nonlinear device, and that's what's happening over here, okay? So when you actually expand this out, you'll have m of t squared, and then you have plus two cos, oh sorry, two m of t, cos omega ct, and then plus cos squared omega ct. Okay, so that's what happens when you actually multiply it out, sorry. Okay, and that's what's happening over here. So this guy expanded is over here, all right? And this guy expanded is over, oh, sorry. Uh, what's going on here? Oh, that's missing a term. A cos squared. Sorry, m of t, 2a. Sorry, it's actually, no. Sorry, it's, uh, they're, they're simplifying it here. But anyway, so we have, uh, okay. Yeah, it's simplified a little bit. I didn't follow these. But yeah, so what you do is you, uh, Sorry, you're not expanding, I'm sorry. So you have this guy here, right? So it's these guys here. And then this guy here is expanded from here. This, uh, let's see here. Yes, this over here, okay? So this corresponds with that. So you're, uh, you're multiplying an A in, and then here you're just expanding this out, multiplying a B, and that's what you get here, okay? And then on the other side, okay, we have minus minus, which becomes plus, Okay, so that's what's going on over here. And then minus becomes subtra subtracting with that. And then you just expand this out. This is also the same. It's just instead of a plus, you have a minus. And that's what's happening over here. This, this over here. And then you'll see that a lot of stuff cancels. Okay, so for example, the A and the A here cancel. The B and the M squared here cancel. And also this and this cancels. And then when you add this up, you're left with this over here. Okay, we're very close. We wanted a double side branch suppressed carrier modulation. We don't want the original message, we just want this one by itself. We just want this guy over here. So what you can do is you can apply a bandpass filter to remove any components that are less than, you know, the bandwidth centered at omega C and just you want to filter that out. So you can actually apply a bandpass filter to get rid of this, which is what you get here. So when you apply a bandpass filter, what I mean by bandpass filter is that you have something like this, right? Where any frequencies between zero and some I guess you can call this F, I suppose, and minus F, you filter out, and then anything else you filter in, and then anything after this, you, fil you know, it goes away. So this bandpass filter, we get rid of that, and then all you're left with is this guy.
So that's one way you can actually generate a double cyber and suppressed carrier signal. You just have a bunch of, a couple of nonlinear devices. You arrange it in such a way where you add and subtract, you put it through the actual devices themselves, add and subtract, put a bandpass filter, and that's what you get. Okay? So you can think of this as your message. It's multiplied by some gain, 4B. Okay? And then what you can do is if you want to get the original, original message, you can apply perhaps like an op-amp or a gain here that'll do 1 over 4B to get, you know, to have the original message. Okay, so you can do that if you wish, but at least it's your original message that is multiplied by some constant k. Okay, so, all right, got about 10 more minutes, we'll take a break. So there's another way to do it. So instead of using the nonlinear device that I talked about, you can actually take a switching modulator. So what you can do is you can generate a square wave that is, that is seen here. So, you, so that's actually very possible. If you take, if you take in, you know, uh, third year electronics, you can generate a score wave using hysteresis with op amps and positive feedback. It's very easy to achieve this, right? So this is just a square wave. Okay, so it's very easy to do that with hysteresis and all that. So instead of multiplying by a cosine wave, what you can do is you can multiply by a square wave instead. And if you remember, this, because this is a periodic square wave signal, you can represent it in terms of its Fourier series, okay? So this is equal to, you know, if you remember the Fourier series formula, it's from minus infinity to infinity, you know, this is the Fourier series coefficients. And it's multiplied by complex exponential, and this is the fundamental frequency, okay? So if I decided to multiply my message signal with a uh, square wave, this is what the result would look like in the end. All right, so it's very similar to a cosine wave, but instead what you're doing is you are varying the height of a square wave instead, okay? And this is what the Fourier transform will look like. So if you take the Fourier transform, if you multiply these two together, remember when you multiply in time, you perform convolution of frequency domain. So you're taking the Fourier transform of the message, right? So this is what the spectrum would be, okay? And then what you're doing is you're, multi or com you're convolving with the Fourier transform of this. And if you remember from last class, if you take the Fourier transform of a complex exponential, you're getting an impulse instead. So these coefficients will stay the same, all right? And then you're convolving, instead of exponentials, these turn into deltas or impulse functions. And then when you convolve with an impulse function, you're just basically taking your original spectrum and shifting it over by whatever the uh, shift is defined for the impulse. So what's going on here is that you are simply taking your Fourier, tr you're taking your baseband message spectrum, and you are shifting it by multiples of your fundamental frequency, which is defined for the square wave, and they're being weighted by Fourier series coefficients. Okay, so the a, I suppose, let me see here. So the a would be the you know the maximum height of the amplitude for your baseband, and then what's happening here is that each of these copies are multiplied by the corresponding Fourier series coefficient for that multiple of the fundamental frequency. Okay, so this will be for n is equal to 1, this is when n is equal to 2, n is equal to minus 1, minus 2, and so on. Okay, so remember, if I want to generate a double sideband suppressed carrier signal, what I need to do is I need to make sure that I keep these two. Remember, you're taking your baseband signal and you're shifting it over by a, you know, the, you know, by the carrier frequency, which is defined by the square wave. So what you can do is, again, you can apply a bandpass filter to get rid of everything else and just leaving those two behind. Okay? So you want to keep these two components because you're doing a double side branch suppressed carrier generation. So you just use a bandpass filter. Okay? So once you, you multiply by your switching signal or your, you know, your switching modulator, you, you run it through a bandpass filter and what you get should be just the double side branch suppressed carrier by itself. So this is what happens when you multiply by a switching regulator, and this is what happens after you bandpass filter. So BPF stands for a bandpass filter. Okay? And that's exactly what will happen. Not bad. Any questions here so far? Okay. So I want to make sure I just raise your hand. Don't be shy. All right? So there are other um, generation techniques for double side by suppressed carrier, but I'll let you take a look at the textbook. But I just wanted to cover these two. Uh, they're the most common ones to generate DSBSC signals. Because there are other more uh, advanced techniques and that are more efficient or that may be cost effective, but I'll let you take a look at the textbook if you wish. But those are the two that are generally done, or that are generally known in practice. Okay. So just as a sign of convention, when we talk about uh, frequency conversion or heterodyning or mixing, 
what we actually mean is performing a multiplication so that you're taking your spectrum and moving it over to a certain center frequency and you're performing a bandpass filter so that you actually get the actual um, spectrums that are moved over by a certain amount. So multiplication and bandpass filtering is what is known as mixing or frequency conversion but you're basically taking your bandpass or your, your, your baseband signal which is the message signal and you're moving all the frequency components over by a certain amount and that process is what's known as mixing or heterodyning or frequency conversion. You're converting all the frequencies up or down by a certain amount. Okay, so now that we know how to generate double side brand surprise carrier signals, we want to be able to receive the signal on the receiver end to take a look at what the actual message was actually being transmitted. And this is what is known as demodulation. So the process of modulation is to take your signal, multiply it by some carrier, whether it's a switching modulator or putting it through a nonlinear device, to actually make your signal compatible to be transmitted over to the channel. And now that it's transmitted over to the channel, you want to be able to receive that signal using the receiver to recover what the original message signal was. And that process is what is known as demodulation. So modulation is performing that transformation, and demodulation is undoing what that transformation was. All right? So the, the quickest way to do it, all right, if you remember um, what the cosine does in terms of the spectrum, when you take your signal and you multiply by cosine wave, you're taking each of your spectrum and you're shifting it plus minus f of c, all right, or whatever the frequency is defined for the cosine is. If you actually took that transmitted signal and multiplied that signal again by cosine, you actually get a very interesting result. And let's, let me show you what happens, all right? So if this is your transmitted signal. Okay, this is your transmitting signal, and what you're going to do is you're going to multiply by another cosine of the same frequency. This is what happens. Okay, so this here was, uh, it was, let's see here, it was uh, M of T cos omega C T. Okay? Now, if you're, you're going to multiply this again by the same carrier frequency, so or the, the same carrier with the same frequency. So once you multiply this with your cosine, we get cos of squared. Okay. If you remember the property for cosine squared, it becomes 1 over 2 plus 1 over 2 cos of 2x, right? So in that case, that's what's happening here. And then notice that we have the original input. So this is the original input. And then we also have a band passed version that's centered at 2 omega c. Band pass version centered at uh, 2 omega c. Okay? So if you want to get the original message back, what you probably want to do is you want to use a low pass filter to get rid of this band pass component. So put a low pass filter, center it at zero, and make sure that it spans the bandwidth of your signal. And then you want to filter everything out that is outside of the bandwidth. So if you apply a low pass filter, you'll get rid of that, and then you'll get the original message back. Okay? So this is your baseband signal that is scaled by your carry, the height of your carry divided by two. And then this is the message signal that is centered at plus minus 2FC or 2 omega C or whatever, whatever, you know, whatever notation you want to use. So if you want to get rid of this, you just use low pass filtering and you'll get rid of this component and you're left with the original message itself. So making sure that the carrier frequency is much, much larger than the bandwidth, okay, if you don't do this and what's going to happen is that you'll have some of your spectrum crossing over into the negative side and you actually get aliasing, which is bad, which is why you need to make sure that the carrier frequency is much larger than the actual bandwidth of the signal itself. So you just use low pass filtering, get rid of this component over here and you're left with that original one by itself. And then you may have to apply like an additional gain to get rid of the, uh, you know, the AC over two. So you'd multiply by the inverse of this. So you do two over AC to get rid of that gain and you get the original message back. Okay, so uh, this is just a graphical representation of how you would actually recover it. Okay, so remember that when you multiply your transmitted signal by cosine wave, you get cos squared. And then this is what you actually get in the end over here, this guy right over here. And this is what it looks like pictorially, all right? So this is what's happening on the transmitter side, okay? So actually, so this is, let me see here. So right here, this is what is transmitted, okay? So this is your message signal, all right? And then this is your cosine wave. And then what's gonna happen is that if you decide to square it, well, this is what happens here. So all the negative values become positive and the actual frequency gets a little tighter. All right, so 
if you were to take your message signal and multiply it by cosine squared, that's what the red value looks like, all right? And then what will happen is that after you perform your low pass filtering, you're left with just the message signal itself and then you get the blue one in the end. But this is what it looks like when it comes on the receiver side. So this is what happens when you receive. Okay, so this here, as you see, you see the original spectrum by itself and then you have two copies of it, one at plus two FC and one at two minus FC. And then you apply a low pass filter to get rid of those two band pass components and you're left with the original message itself. So that's what you do to recover it. Okay, so just a couple more slides, we'll take a break, all right? So the actual pipeline, if you wanna go from original message, transmit, and then receive, this is what the pipeline looks like. So this is your message signal. Okay, so this is the message signal. Okay, so your modulator is basically taking your message signal and multiplying it by a cosine of a known frequency. Well, this is the carrier frequency. Okay, so this is so this is the output here. So this would be the uh, transmitted signal. Push it through the channel, and then this is what is received. This is the received side. We're assuming no noise, of course. But we'll cover that much later. The received side. You're going to take your same. You're you're going to take your uh, transmitted signal, multiply by another cosine. Okay, and then you have your low pass filter to get rid of the band pass component. And then you finally are left with the original signal. So this is the scaled message signal. And then it's up to you. You can leave the scale in if you want, or you can uh, multiply by the inverse of the gain that is applied to get the original message by itself without any, uh, you know, without any height modifications. Okay. Um, okay, we'll take a break here. We'll come back and I'll carry on with, uh, with this stuff here. Okay, so we'll take a break. We'll take a break for now.